Um, so today's seminar is, as I said, the second of the series. Um, we have um, this uh, seminar series we proposed we, we had proposed before to have it every two months um, and we would have it on the second or the last Tuesday of the month at 12 noon Eastern Standard Time or six o'clock Brussels time, um, which is what I'm at. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Sheila Heymans from the executive, the executive director of the European Marine Board. So in case you haven't, you haven't seen me before. Um, and today's seminar um, is the second one in the series. We hope to have another on the 29th of September and another on the 24th of November, and we're still looking for speakers. So if anybody's keen to speak on those dates, then please let us know. And of course, for the, uh, the following ones as well. Um, so without further ado, it's not really about me, it's about David. David is going to be um, speaking today. He is Dr. David Chagaris, um, who's a, he's a research assistant professor at the University of um, Florida. And um, you can read his background there. He's a quantitative fishery scientist who's worked on population dynamics and ecosystem models, looking at multiple stressors and ecosystems response and policy options and so forth, and um, looking at new management reference points for uh, species. And he is going to talk today about the ecological reference points for Atlantic Menhaden. And again, the um, his Atlantic Menhaden is an important forage fish and he's going to be talking about the Northwest Atlantic continental, continental Shelf. And I'm not going to give you any more details than that, but I would like uh, if Lee can, can um, change my face for David's, that'd be great. And then David, uh, you're good to go. David, you have to unmute yourself if you want to speak. OK. Share my screen and OK, you see my presentation. All right, uh, well, thank you for the introduction, Sheila, and thanks everybody for coming to the seminar. Uh, today I'm going to talk about um, Atlantic Menhaden, which is a, a forage fish on the east coast of the United States. And the work that we've done over the last couple of years to establish uh, what we're calling these ecological reference points and um, you'll you'll learn to know what those are by the end of the presentation okay before i begin i, I must i must first acknowledge everybody that's been a part of this um, a lot of this work was funded by a project that um, was awarded to andre buchheiser at humboldt state university through the lindfest ocean program uh, I'm a co-PI on that project along with Ed Hood and Tom Miller at the University of Maryland and Amy Schuler at the NOAA Beaufort Lab. Um, Andre had previously developed a, uh, a large ecosystem model um, of this system, and so we've used that model and adapted it for the development of the ERPs. Um, secondly, I have to also uh, give a really warm uh, shout out to the Atlantic States ERP work group. Um, this is probably by far my favorite committee that I serve on. Uh, we've been together for uh, well over five years, some of us going on over 10 years. Um, and, and a lot of the work that you'll see today is a, is a culmination of, of things that we've done over the last 10 years. And I believe that everybody on this committee has contributed at some point or another. <clears throat> um, so thanks to all those on the ERP work group. OK, so Atlantic Menhaden, uh, most of us just know exactly what Menhaden are because we've been thinking about it and talking about it so much, but maybe there's others around that um, that aren't familiar with this species, but it's a small uh, pelagic fish clupeate of the clupeidae family. Um, it's distributed in estuary, estuarine and coastal waters from Florida up to about Canada, uh, but the center of the distribution is around the Chesapeake Bay area in the Mid-Atlantic region. Uh, they live to be about six years old, uh, between six to ten years old um, and they commonly grow to around 15 centimeters but they make it as big as 30 centimeters. <clears throat> uh, they mature early at age one. Um, during the winter they migrate south off the coast of North Carolina to spawn um, and during the summer larger older individuals can be found further north um, and they're, they're a filter feeder of uh, uh, planktivore fish and they also are forage for many other species. So they have a really important and well-recognized role in the ecosystem. 
uh, mainly as food for predators. And this this goes back a long time. Uh, so they're they're preyed upon by many resident estuarine and coastal fish, such as bluefish, striped bass, and weak fish, which you'll hear more about today. Um, also, highly migratory species, tunas, uh, billfish, sailfish migrate in and out of the system and feed on menhaden. Uh, they're food for many marine mammals as well as birds. Uh, so they serve a very critical role in the ecosystem and they make up a large portion of fish biomass where they do exist. Um, they also have a have a role in water filtration. I won't talk much about this today, um, but it does have some implications for water quality in, in some of the estuarine systems and just some back of the envelope calculations. Uh, you can get to an estimate that a single menhaden can filter up to 30 trillion thousand kiloliters of water each year. Um, and so if you add that up, uh, that's not for a single menhaden, but for a population of menhaden. So if you add that up, it could have big implications for water quality. But we're going to talk more about their role as a forage fish today. And then a little bit about the Atlantic Menhaden fishery. Um, there's really two part, two different components to the fishery. There's a reduction fishery, uh, which is the larger industrialized uh, fleet. Um, and they basically use large per se operations. They'll use spotter planes to, to locate the schools. Uh, they have a mothership that comes out so you can see uh, the the mothership that has these two smaller persane boats and they'll they'll persane large schools of menhaden and process them down into fish oil uh, fish solubles and fish meal that are used for uh, animal feed vitamins all kind all types of applications now this fishery has been around for a long time uh it dates back to the early 1800s and, and probably even earlier in some areas uh, of the east coast during its heyday back in the 1950s they were landing uh, close to 700,000 metric, ton metric tons each year. And, and at one point they had 20 factories along the East Coast. Uh, that's currently down to one factory that's located in Virginia. Um, and, and as of 2018, they landed about 150,000 metric tons, which still makes it the largest fishery on the US East Coast by weight. Um, so you can see some of these older pictures here of the, of the Manhattan fishery as well as uh, their spatial distribution patterns. Uh, most, of the, most of the commercial reduction fleet operates off the coast of Maryland, uh, off, outside the Chesapeake Bay, but there are catches that take place in North Carolina and further up. Um, and there is some catch that, takes, that happens inside the Chesapeake Bay. <clears throat> the other part is the bait fishery, which makes up about 25% of the total landings. Um, and this bait fishery is becoming increasingly more important, um, especially for uh, the main lobster fishery as the Atlantic herring populations have been in recent decline. So how are Manhattan assessed and managed? Well, they're managed by the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, um, and there is a, a board, you'll hear me talk about the board, and that is a, a, a group of um, representatives from each member state uh, that vote on, on the regulations. Uh, they're also managed by the Virginia Marine Resource Commission for the landings inside Chesapeake Bay. Um, that's a recent development where they used to be managed by the state legislature and now they're managed by the VMRC. Uh, one thing we'll talk a lot about today is this Amendment 3 to the Fishery Management Plan, which was approved in 2017. And that's what really um, jump-started all of this work because it, it basically man called for the adoption of these ecological reference points. Uh, the fishery is managed with a coastwide total allowable catch. So the TAC, we'll talk about that a little bit later too. Um, and in 2019, the TAC was set at 216,000 metric tons. Um, it's been incrementally reduced um, each year over the last few years. Um, this is, is now 216,000. Uh, the stock is routinely assessed um, following the CDAR process. So we have transparent data assessment and review workshops. Uh, the, the assessment is done out of the NOAA Beaufort lab using the Beaufort assessment model, uh, but it's done as part of a committee. So there's a, uh, each species that's managed by the Atlantic States has its own technical committee that, that is part of the assessment process. And then we also have our ecological reference points work group, which I, um, I mentioned earlier, that has been a part of this stock assessment process. And in 2000, 2019 was the last assessment. Um, and the status was not overfished or experienced in overfishing. So the Manhattan stock itself is in, is in a pretty healthy condition according to the stock assessment. <clears throat> so along the path of these ERPs, and as I mentioned, this work had been ongoing for a while, 
Um, I joined the I, I joined this process around 2013 or 2014, and we were just coming off um, the MS, the multi-species virtual population analysis that they had used previously to estimate predation mortality rates that then fed back into the stock assessment model. Um, we were trying to update that and, and we eventually abandoned the MSVPA because we didn't feel like it was one stable enough and it wasn't really providing the types of information that we thought could help managers. And so after that, um, the, A the ASMFC held a ecosystem management objectives workshop um, and that was designed to try to try to articulate what the objectives were for our, our ERP work group and what uh, what, what were the management objectives that the models we created needed to address? Um, so we set out to um, to develop a few models and we explored a suite of tools um, from about 2015 to 2017. Uh, then in 2017, Amendment 3 passed and we were given two more years to develop the ERPs, uh, which brings us to November of last year when these the ecosystem model and the ERPs uh, passed a critical uh, technical review, uh, which then went to the board in February of this year. During that meeting, the board requested to see uh, some additional analyses and some additional runs, and uh, we'll be taking that back to the board um, in a couple of weeks where they're expected to finally vote on these ERPs. So uh, we're hoping for a, a positive vote. Um, we feel like the climate is right, so but we'll see. Um, after this board votes, after the vote, uh, if if these ERPs are approved, then they would need to become part of the routine assessment time frame. Uh, so we would be looking at another benchmark assessment. We can update these ERPs uh, in a few years. So the modeling approaches that we considered as a committee uh, range from from quite simple to to really complex. Um, we looked at. Uh, a couple of surplus production models, one that had a time varying R parameter and the other one that had a uh, predation effect in it, a top down effect from striped bass. Uh, we also uh, had a multi species statistical catch at age model. And then we had two eco path with eco sim models. One is the NWAX mice model, which is a model of interme intermediate complexity for ecosystem assessment. Um, that's the one I'll be talking about most today. Uh, but there was also a larger ecosim model that Andre had developed previously that was updated as part of this process as well. So here we have a table that we put together um, that, that highlights the the management ecosystem management objectives and how each of these models can address those objectives. And so we have along the top in these four boxes are sort of the the fundamental object objectives, and then. The smaller boxes are the the means objectives, and, and you know how how would we actually achieve these objectives, the fundamental objectives. And <clears throat> so, if you look down here where we have the NWAX, these are the ecosim models. Um, this is the only model that could actually address almost all of these uh, management objectives. Uh, most importantly, is able to predict the effect of uh, menhaden harvest on predator biomass and predator population sizes. The Vader model or the, the statistical catch at age model uh, at present hasn't built in that bottom up uh, functionality yet. And so while it, it can address top down effects on menhaden, it can't address those bottom up effects of uh, menhaden harvest on predators like Ecosim can. All right, so now getting into some of the to the models here. So we have the, the Northwest, Northwest Atlantic Continental Shelf ecosystem is basically the domain for the modeling. Um, and this was a model that was developed by Andre Buchheister at Humboldt State, um, actually while he was doing his postdoc at University of Maryland. And it has the full NWAX model has 61 model groups, um, has a larger set of menhaden predators, including you know, birds and mammals and some migratory pelagics. And as part of this process, it was updated uh, to more recent time series <clears throat> and done some other diagnostics. Uh, during the development of the ERPs and through discussions with the committee and the management board uh, and also coming out of the management workshop is that they were, they were interested in something that had uh, less complexity, something that was going to be easier for them to interpret. And so we reduced this full NWAX model to what we're calling the NWAX MICE model. So it went from 61 model groups to 17 groups. 
And it includes the key managed predators that they care about. And that's striped bass, weak fish, bluefish, and to a lesser extent, spiny dogfish. And this is the model that we eventually used to develop the ERPs. So why did we go from this complex model uh, that is probably maybe more realistic representation of the system to the simple model? Well, the complex model, as all of you know, there's there's always going to be species in there that we don't have data for. Um, and so we, we remove some of those groups that have high uncertainty and few data inputs or few data sources. Um, and the simple model then focuses on those key predators that are that are managed by ASM, ASMFC. <clears throat> um, not that the birds and the whales aren't important, but they don't have jurisdiction over those units. Uh, we also felt that at least in the in the initial development of the ERPs, that having a model that was easier to update within the assessment and management timeframe. So looking at something that would need to be updated on a, a two to three year basis, uh, we needed something that was a little bit simple. And we also had a lot of gains in computational efficiency. Um, with this with a smaller model, we can fit fit the time series much faster. So we can we can develop uh, a whole a, a number of fitted ecosystem models to really try to get at some of the uncertainty. Um, in the parameter estimates. So it definitely has some advantages, um, but there, it, it does come at a cost where you aren't actually capturing all the predation mortality that might be happening in the system. So the Ecosim mice model, um, the NWAX mice model was calibrated to 18 indices of abundance. Uh, now the mice model was calibrated to actual fishery independent survey data or, or standardized recreational krill surveys. And so you see a lot of variability in the observed data points in the plot on the right for biomass. Um, we also fit the 10 catch time series, and I'll show those in a minute. Uh, but these, um, as part of this process, we fit 32 different ecosim models, evaluating different combinations of prey switching and foraging time adjustment. Uh, we developed a, um, a methodology for adjusting the vulnerabilities when they were estimated at their upper or lower bounds. Uh, we looked at different adjustments to the diet matrix under sensitivities of what if the ecotrophic efficiency of Menhaden were higher. Uh, we included models fitted with and without primary production anomaly, anomalies and, and even used the, the other mortality forcing time series to drive recruitment deviations similar to what's done in the stock assessment. So we, we tried a lot of different things. Those last three um, ecosystem model types were <clears throat> mainly exploratory, uh, whereas the other three were focused on uh, a simple model that could be used for management. Uh, we also developed a repeated search methodology, so where we repeated this, the sensitivity search and the, and the calibration of time series about five or six times until the sums of squares and the AIC stabilized. And out of all those models, the weighted sums of squares ranged from about 1,031 to 1,327. Uh, only those models that included either primary production anomalies or recruitment deviations were able to capture some of that uh, that high interannual variability. And those are the ones that had the best fits, but it's not the model that was used for management. Uh, the best fit run that was used for the ERP development, which is this black line, SIM 3.5, included prey switching turned on for the Menhaden predators, and we also applied the vulnerability caps uh, because of some dynamic dynamic instability that was observed. Um, here just showing the fits to the catch. Uh, the fits to catch were, were much better than the fits to the uh, biomass indices just because there was less variability. But in both of these, we, we tend to capture the general trends, at least for striped bass. Uh, Menhaden is, is fairly flat over this time period. And weak fish is always a problem. In all the models that we've explored, weak fish is a problem. And, and there's, there's some different things that they do with the stock assessment. Uh, and there's some presumed changes in mortality that we haven't been able to account for. But overall, the model fit fairly well and, and is able to replicate trends similar to the stock assessment for most species, except for weak fish. So other diagnostics, I mean, we fit these models a bunch of different ways. Um, and, and those of you that have fit ecosim models in the past have probably recognized that you get a lot of parameters that are estimated at one, vulnerabilities that are estimated at 1.0 or vulnerabilities that are estimated at, um, at a maximum. And in some cases we found that that may cause dynamic instability. And so when we looked at these equilibrium uh, yield curves, 
for example, with Menhaden, the blue line here was actually had the lowest sums of squares out of the, the figures on this plot. But when we started running this model out to high fishing mortality rates, we saw this dynamic instability and we were able to isolate that down to being um, a low vulnerability setting for just one of the Menhaden prey items in their zooplankton prey group. Um, and so when we tick that up just a little bit from one to 1.1, then we get a, uh, a much improved uh, yield curve. And then we also investigated some of these uh, stock recruit relationships for Menhaden to make sure that we are getting uh, some type of uh, emergent stock recruit pattern that would help us understand how the productivity of the, the species is being modeled. Okay, so that's the modeling. So back to our, our ecological reference point objectives. And, and now that we built the model and we got to come up with these ERPs, uh, we weren't actually told what an ERP was. Um, so we had to first figure out what it was, what that would look like. Uh, but if we think about their objectives, uh, one of the objectives is to sustain Menhaden to provide for predators. And <clears throat> we, uh, they didn't tell us which predators and they didn't tell us the desired level to sustain them at. So we recognize that this is in, inherently will involve a trade-off in the form of Menhaden harvest versus predator stock size. <clears throat> and that there is no single correct answer, but there's a continuum of solutions along that trade-off frontier that depend on how you value the fisheries and what you want, you, what you want them to look like. Uh, we recognized as a committee that this was going to be a decision for managers, not for us modelers. And so we set out using this NWAX MICE model to map out that trade-off relationship. So first, to get at the which predators, uh, we use the full NWAX model to evaluate the sensitivity of harvest, sensitivity of predators to Manhattan harvest. So we relied on this full NWAX model because it included a larger suite of predators. And if there was something that we were missing with the simple model, this would hopefully identify it. Uh, this analysis does show that there was a weak effect of on bluefish and weak fish, which is one of the two of the three predators included in the mice model, as well as five other uh, species um, that were uh, not managed by ASMFC. Uh, the model also showed that uh, striped bass is the is the strong is the most sensitive predator to Manhattan harvest, um, and this was supported by the the mice model as well, as well as nearshore piscivorous birds. And so we set out to develop these ERPs, and we we developed the ERPs based on the relationship of Manhattan harvest to striped bass, under the assumption that any um, actions taken to uh, sustained striped bass would also maintain other predators that are less sensitive. And so based on based on that rationale, we developed the trade-off curve between Menhaden and striped bass. So developing the ERPs. So we had our fitted ecosystem model. Um, and so then we ran um, a number of projection scenarios going out to 40 years over different combinations of striped bass and Menhaden fishing mortalities. So in this plot, you see the historical reconstruction of striped bass from Ecosim, and then starting at the terminal year, we do a number of projections at different levels of Menhaden F. So blue would be, okay, the top would be F equals zero, and all the way down in the red would be uh, an F of about 0.5 in Ecosim units. Uh, this scenario has striped bass fished at their F target, and so we would expect striped bass to be able to reach their biomass target at some point, uh, depending on where Menhaden are fished at that time. And if we do that over a range of striped bass fishing mortalities, we can then develop a surface plot of striped bass biomass ratio as a function of Menhaden F and striped bass fishing mortality. Uh, this, this figure here is, is the product of 462 ecosim runs that were done using the multi-sim plugin. So if we look at where we're at in the current situation, under the current F of striped bass, this horizontal line here, uh, we can see that their biomass will be late, will remain below the threshold across all Menhaden F rates. So things that are above this biomass threshold line in the red is below the threshold and down towards the cooler colors would be above the target. In between those two lines is between the threshold and the target. So we want to at least be above the threshold, but ideally above the target, which would be down here. Um, and so the current 
F rate of striped bass. And this is also supported by the stock assessment, which has them, uh, the status is overfished and overfishing. Uh, so under that current F of striped bass, no matter what you do to Menhaden, you will not bring their biomasses above the threshold. The current ratio is, sits at about 0.66 of the target, and they are overfished and undergoing overfishing. <clears throat> but if we look at striped bass when they're fished at their F target, so what level of Menhaden harvest will not compromise the ability of striped bass to, re it, to reach its single species targets? So now if we look at striped bass at, a target, at their F target of 0.2, there's a range of Menhaden F that allow them to reach their target threshold, uh, target and threshold biomass levels. So where this F equals two, we can draw the line down from the biomass target and draw the line down from the, the biomass threshold to get our Menhaden fishing mortality rates. The current Menhaden fishing mortality rate is shown in the black vertical dashed line, and it's lower than the ERP target because of the proactive and precautionary measures that the board has taken in the recent years. So a better way to look at this is if we take this slice from, the, from this rainbow plot and put it on two dimensions, we can now see this trade-off curve much clearer. And so what you see is the, the equilibrium effect of Menhaden fishing mortality on striped bass as a function of their biomass target. And so as you go down this curve, the green line here is the current fishing mortality rate of Menhaden or the 2017 Menhaden fishing mortality rate. Uh, the ERPF target and threshold are in blue, whereas the single species F target and F threshold for Menhaden are in red. And so we define the ERPs as the ERPF target, which is the maximum Menhaden F that maintains striped bass at their biomass target. And the ERPF threshold is the maximum Menhaden F that maintains striped bass at their biomass threshold when striped bass are fished at their, fish, at their target fishing mortality rate. For all the other species in the model, we held their fishing mortality rates constant in this scenario. And so you'll see what clearly stands out is that the the ERP F rates result in a reduction in uh, Menhaden F of about 30 to 40 percent from the single species reference points. But it's still an increase from the current F. And depending on where managers want to operate along this trade off curve, there's a range of, of options between the target and the threshold that they could choose from. Now, at the board meeting in February, we were asked to uh, provide some alternative ERP scenarios. And basically what was interesting about this is that these scenarios that were requested by the board re basically represent different assumptions about future ecosystem conditions. And when we ran the model under different assumptions, for example, by allowing the other species to build up to their biomass target or allowing the other species to, um, to be maintained at their biomass thresholds, we get different ERPs. Um, and what we found was that the difference in these ERPs was largely uh, driven by the effect that Atlantic herring, which is the alternative prey in the model, uh, have on striped bass. Now, striped bass prey on Atlantic herring, but it's mostly a seasonal, um, a, a seasonal event. So when striped bass are migrating north in the summer, they'll overlap more with with Atlantic herring. And so the diet sources indicate that they're eating more Atlantic herring certain times of year in certain places. Uh, but the, ecos the mice model at that point didn't have any type of seasonal uh, patterns into it. And so we, we just tested some seasonality on the vulnerability, uh, the vulnerability parameters for striped bass and Atlantic herring and did find that when we included the seasonality that they were eating a, a more reasonable proportion of herring were in striped bass diets and the the range in these ERPs was much smaller and so we didn't see a big shift but we when we account for seasonality we didn't see a big a big change in these scenarios <clears throat> and so we were moving forward with these example ERPs because they represent uh, the the short term ecosystem conditions for which the board is is setting these tax. And so how does this all feed back into the tech? Well, we didn't use the mice model, the the ecosystem model, to estimate a tech, but instead we feed those fishing mortality rates back to the stock assessment model, and then they can estimate a tech uh, for that 
prescribed F rate for the ERP target and the ERP threshold will have an associated TAC with it. Or they can also evaluate the probability that, that any other given TAC will exceed those targets and thresholds. And so, for example, if we look at this kind of orange colored bar, um, we can see that the probability that the current TAC of 216,000 metric tons will exceed the target is uh, fairly high or is greater than, greater than 50%. Uh, but there's no chance that the current TAC will exceed the F threshold. If we build um, according to those alternative scenarios, if everything is at their biomass target, mainly Atlantic herring, uh, then the current uh, TAC has a very low probability of exceeding the ERP reference points. Whereas if Atlantic herring are at their threshold condition, then the, the, uh, the TAC will almost certainly exceed the target. And so this is getting at some of the risk associated with these reference points and how the board views that risk in light of where the other species are going. <clears throat> so the research and modeling recommendations coming out of this, um, the one thing that really stands out is that we need to think carefully about how we, we represent seasonality in this model. These species um, overlap in time and space at different, uh, different um, frequencies. And so the next iteration of this will probably include some type of seasonal forcing functions, either in ecosystem or ideally uh, building up the eco space spatial temporal model that would that really capture those predator prey overlaps. Um, some of what we've done with this trade off curve, I think, could be improved with policy optimization. Um, if we know the relative value of each of these uh, fisheries, then the policy optimization tool in ecosystem could help identify what would be the optimum policy given how you uh, how you view those different components. Um, there's all, as soon as we built this MICE model, we immediately started getting more questions about, well, what about these other predators? And so we do have this full NWAX model. And so that is going to continue to be updated alongside of this, of the MICE model. It might not be able to be updated and maintained within a two to three year time frame, but probably a longer time frame. So that we will have this full ecosystem model that has a more complete suite of predators that we could run alongside of the simple model. Uh, we also noticed that, as you saw with some of that dynamic instability, um, that one of the things that's really going to help this would be some improvements to the parameter estimation in the ecosim fitting routine. Um, and I've, I've, I've discussed this with some of the development team, um, but things like having some some penalized bounds on the parameter search, or reducing the um, the precision in the in the sums and squares measure might help keep those parameters off of those upper and lower bounds. Um, we're still exploring these other modeling approaches. A nice thing about this ERP concept is that it could, in theory, be developed with any type of model as so long as it has that bottom up feedback from prey to predators. And so there's still going to be an effort to get that functionality into that multi species statistical catch and age model. Now, there's also a lot of things that we can do outside of modeling. Um, <clears throat> and so we, we need to have more comprehensive diet studies. Uh, at least for these key suite of species that we're looking at evaluating for the ERPs and also need to think about some ways that we could actually do some field work to to monitor predator condition as a function of menhaden consumption and there's been a lot of um, a lot of technological advances that I think could really help make that efficient. So <clears throat> So it took about 10 years for the Apollo missions to reach the moon. And you know, it took us a combined 10 years to come up with these ERPs. I mean, we had a lot less funding and manpower and less clear objectives, uh, but this is not mission accomplished for us. And it is, it is admittedly not a giant leap for mankind either, but it's rather a first step towards EBFM. And while these ERPs uh, may seem incremental, um, just getting buy-in for management and, and inserting these uh, ecosystem models into the existing management framework is a major step forward. So I think Willy Wonka's spin on the Neil Armstrong quote is more on point with what we've accomplished. Um, we do expect these ERPs to evolve over time and to become more holistic. Uh, that's based on some of the comments coming from the board um, when you listen carefully to the questions that they're asking. Um, but that's gonna require some, some changes to the management system. And what I mean by that is that the, the Atlantic States uh, Marine Fisheries Commission manages um, over 20 species of fish, and each one has a similar structure where they've got a management board and there's a technical committee and there's a stock assessment process underneath that. 
and all that feeds into the the uh, interjurisdictional uh, fishery management plan policy board. But the problem is that these species boards and the TCs they don't they don't talk to each other. All this happens uh, independently of one another. And so, in order for us to to move forward to true ecosystem based management, it's going to require some feedback and integration among the single species management boards within ASMFC. And, and this, these discussions are taking place now, uh, but this is going to be a slower process. All right, so some summary and conclusions. Uh, we developed uh, Manhattan ecological reference points using an ecosystem model of intermediate complexity. Uh, those ERPs were based on the trade-off relationship between Menhaden and striped bass, because striped bass was the most sensitive predator fish in the models. Uh, the, the F target, the ERP, F target, and F threshold values should maintain striped bass at their target and threshold biomass when striped bass are fished at their target F rate. Uh, and, by, and it should also maintain other predators that are less sensitive to striped bass. Uh, the next iteration of these models in the ERPs will need to incorporate additional predators um, as well as those spatial and seasonal processes. And if these ERPs are passed at the August 4th vote, um, it will, I think, represent a, a big first step towards EBFM. So thank you for coming to the seminar and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, David. Um, yeah, I can hear myself speak. <laughs> I hope there's no feedback for you guys. Um, so thank you very much. That was really interesting. Uh, I think we haven't got that many questions uh, in the question and answer yet. So please, if you have any, but of course I have some, as you will can very well imagine. Um, and my question, I'm going to combine with the question that uh, Christy had. Uh, she said, can you talk more about the prey switching that you mentioned? And, and following on from that, my question is, um, you talked about the interaction between herring and, and um, Menhaden in, in this model. Is that the prey switching you mean? Or did you mean some other prey switching as well? So the prey switching actually came about by um, questions from the industry. So they would often claim that, look, there's a lot of other prey items out there. If we fish Menhaden, the predators can just switch to something else and, um, and, and the effects of Menhaden harvest won't, won't have an effect on the predators. And so we, we fit the model. The way we got to the prey switching was by fitting the model over different values of prey switching. And the one with prey switching equal to one would imply that the, the predator search rates will uh, change in proportion to the prey abundances. And so they are changing over time. Um, and so that allows for some switching of prey. And by switching, it means that they're, they're, when another prey item is increasing, they will more, they will more quickly stop eating menhaden and eat that other prey item. And so that gave the best fits uh, to the data. Um, but also the other effect that we saw when we were looking at the, the equilibrium uh, analysis was that with prey switching turned on, you could actually harvest menhaden a little bit harder. So their F and SY was a little bit higher. And I, I think that's because as you go, as you increase F on menhaden and their stocks come down, then the predators will switch slightly to other prey. It wasn't a big change, but it was, but it, it was an effect that was there. And how that feeds into Atlantic herring, <clears throat> um, it does allow them. So when the model first starts, uh, Atlantic herring are increasing and so striped bass then sweat, eat, eat a lot of Atlantic herring and what it shows what the model was predicting initially was that they would eat about 20 to 30 percent of their diet was Atlantic herring throughout the year but in reality it's about 20 or 30 percent of, of their diet during the summer and during the winter when they're down south it's about five percent of their diet and so when we put in that seasonal forcing function, which was just a made up forcing function for, for testing and demonstration, it actually resulted in a, a more realistic diet proportion for striped bass in Atlantic herring. Okay, thanks. And um, I think Christy also had a, a question about, um, about how you do it. How do you actually um, do the prey switching? And I don't know if you want to talk through that a little bit or if you want to have the conversation with her separately. Um, but it's in the group info, but yeah. I've never played with it myself, Christy, um, but that's where you do it. And maybe uh, at one stage, uh, it'd be quite nice to have a, a good sort of stepwise how you did it would be quite interesting, I, I think, Dave. 
Yeah, so we have a paper that's in preparation that's going to describe this whole process in a lot more detail. Okay, thanks. Can, can, just a comment about this? Yes, go for it. Um, yes, we are just finishing a paper now uh, on on Pacific herring and the interaction with uh, stellar sea lion. And a key there is that stellar sea lion can feed on forage fish like herring uh, down to very low levels because of the schooling before, uh, which here is in connection with uh, spawning. And out of five areas, the, the areas where there are large um, herring concentrations, herring schools, and, and lots of uh, sea lion. The more sea lions there are in those areas, the worse the uh, populations are off. Uh, it's a question of really of getting into a predator pit in, in those cases, and switching will have just the opposite effect of what we, what we see in, in those areas. So we have to be careful with switching and small pelagics as, as soon as they're schooling, because the issue as this illustrates, we have five different populations. Some of them are doing really well, even though when they're juveniles, they appear in the same area. But when 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 the herring uh, aggregate in schools and you have the predators there, that's where the things happen. It's a spatial question. That's a, that's what it boils down to. And they, you talk about that, and uh, I think it's reasonable to look at them. What are you? What is your? Um, how are you going to tackle this issue? Because it is a major issue, and switching is only going to help you. A little bit. It's right. a spatial issue you have to tackle. Yeah, and, and you're right. Like the switching didn't really change um, change the dynamics a whole lot. Um, and I haven't gone through and evaluated how the vulnerabilities were estimated under different ones. I think there might be some inf useful information to understand what the vulnerabilities are doing when prey switching is turned on or off. But you're right. As we go to um, a seasonal or then a seasonal and spatial model. Um, I think that the, those prey switching parameters might not be relevant anymore because it would be more of an emergent property as they're getting into their, their spatial overlap arenas. Um, one of the things that we do have kind of in our back pocket is as part of that multi-species virtual population analysis, uh, we had gone through a big exercise to quantify the spatial seasonal overlap that fed into one of their uh, availability matrices. And so we can use that information to help set up um, at least the seasonal forcing functions within ecosystem. Um, <clears throat> the problem was that when we went, see, we couldn't just go seasonal with the Menhaden and Atlantic herring interaction without thinking about how, how, what would be the the seasonal effect on other species as well. Um, and so that was the seasonal component was just done as a test case. Um, but I think what the, the strategy will be to step through, continue with ecosystem by incorporating some of those seasonal uh, forcing functions on the vulnerability parameters and and then building up to a uh, spatial temporal ecospace model. I think the one thing you should consider would be for the spatial model uh, to make a spatial mice model. Yes. Which I don't think, well, I don't think it's just uh, really as more than a concept, but if you made one that say had, I'm looking at the screen right now, I have four, I have four pictures on my screen and um, uh, if you made uh, if you made a, a spatial model that had just two or three boxes mm -hmm. uh, representing if if the striped bass that in, sometimes they are together with herring sometimes they're together with uh, with a menhaid and maybe sometimes they are in other fields I think that would capture it much better than a seasonality mm -hmm. because with seasonality uh, seasonality once you get into that. Uh, it's really messy because you you will have what about productivity? What about the temperature? What what about all the different things that changes over the season? Yeah. And you won't get high productivity of herring in one po point, so they do that, and and menhaden and other points. That's it's because it's spatial. Yep. Yeah, I agree. We're trying to model. I mean, we we tried to build the simplest model that we could, but then as soon as we built it, we realized that it was it was probably too simple, um, and. And we'll absolutely be using the MICE model to uh, to build this, to, to do the research and development on the spatial model, um, to look at other things like management strategy evaluation and, and policy optimization. And then that can all be kind of ported over to the big complex model over time and eventually build back up to that. 
Uh, but one of the things that, that is challenging, and, and we could talk about this, but that could be challenging with going to eco space is that uh, we don't really have a good way to estimate the parameters in eco space yet. I know this is a big, a big uh, source of improvement for the software and and also doing the the kind of multi sim type runs um, to that was be, that was required to make these trade off frontiers. OK, two things. Forget about the Mac when you go to Ecospace. If you just make it, say, two boxes, mm. you don't have to worry about this burst at all. You can say Stripe bass are here in these months, and then we move north to the other box in these months. That's a and great idea. The ecosystem, ecosystem stays in those ones. In regards to, multi, uh, to the multi sim part of it, uh, we have a Monte Carlo routine for Ecospace. Uh, it's not in the distributed version where we used it now for, for quite a while, so it's it's well established. So you can actually do, do Monte Carlo runs at least on on it. So uh, it's quite feasible, and Joe knows exactly how to do this. He he uh, he's the one I worked with on this. Well, if these ERPs get passed, uh, there'll, there'll be some serious conversations about where we go with this model next, and I definitely plan on looping you guys in. But that's a great idea to just have almost like a two area model. You know, which is what some of the stock assessments are doing now uh, with the, you know, they have a two area model, but they aren't using any type of maps in that. It's just spatial separation. That's how to go about it. So, yeah. That's a great idea. OK, that was a good interaction, but I'm going to stop you now because we've got loads of other questions. Oh. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know if is there something else you guys want to talk about with this with this spatial side or can we go to the other questions? Because I'm sure it was useful for everybody else to hear this interaction too. Um, so just one thing, uh, I'll, I'll uh, mention Howard Townsend said that it's really important to note that the use of the multiple models, so the structured surplus production models, a structured models and um, Ecopath, as well as the exploring of multiple formulations in the MICE model was important for getting this approach past the independent review. And multiple models um, with one lead model seems to be a good approach for EBMF. And I think that's certainly what I think is also the case in in ICs in on the side of the pond. So that's great. Then there was a question from I think Desmond Khan was the first one. Um, you said that the low level of weak fish currently is something you can explain. Uh, you can't explain. Sorry, um, if you understood correctly. In 2006, the in the 2006 weak fish assessment. They developed the hypothesis that the recovery of striped bass was the cause of the weak fish decline, um, which occurred concurrently. Um, have you looked at that hypothesis? No, we, we honestly haven't looked as closely into weak fish um, as, as we need to. Uh, and there is striped bass are preying on weak fish in the model, um, but we just weren't able to to get good fits to weak fish in any of those cases, um, at least to the observed data. Uh, but that's going to be something that we'll have to look more closely at. Uh, the weak fish, I mean, yeah, I'm not sure if it was a 2006 assessment, but I know there was a couple of assessments for weak fish that, that didn't pass review and they've tried some things by having a changing uh, total mortality rate. Uh, so there's, there's some stuff there that also makes the stock assessment um, not quite as compatible as we as we might hope, but that's definitely something we need to look into for the next iteration. Thanks. And then Matt Woodstock asks, um, you mentioned that the objectives for management were unclear at the beginning of the project, and, and he says he feels like this is a common problem for ecosystem modelers trying to optimize their work for management. Um, are there any questions you wish you would have asked at the beginning of the process to clarify the objectives? This is an excellent question because I think we all need to answer that question. <laughs> that is a good question, and and they they had that workshop. I, I did. I wasn't actually at that management of uh, ecosystem management objectives workshop, um, and and most of the objectives came out of that were rather vague. I mean, they were helpful, and they did highlight. If you look at them carefully, it highlights some very clear trade offs that they're that in their objectives. Uh, but I think where we're going to push the managers to go now with these objectives is actually making more quantitative objectives um, and maybe trying to prioritize or value the different fisheries because that's ultimately what's going to help them get to an optimum solution. Uh, so maybe getting more quantifiable management objectives uh, would, 
would be most helpful. And that uh, that actually answers a question from Ruben Alarcon, I think is his pronunciation, um, who said, who selects the targets, the Fs? Um, is CBAS more pricey, I'm assuming pricey, than Menhaden? I guess that's... that's and that's exactly what I was referring to. Yeah. So maybe we want to be able to fish striped bass harder than point two um, and, and give up a little bit on Menhaden if it's going to create more value to the system. Okay, and then Joe Luxkovich, um, hi, hey, Joe. <laughs> he, um, he asks about vulnerability caps. Uh, can you explain how you set these? Do you make vulnerability a changing variable from 0.2 to 1 in each of the simulations and pick the lowest sum of squares fit to catch your biomass? Or how do you do it? No, so the vulnerability caps, and this will be described in the paper, um, the vulnerability caps are applied after the fitting process so that if anything was estimated above some threshold, then it would get reduced back down to that threshold. It would generally result in a, in a poor, in a slightly higher sums of squares, but it didn't really change the dynamics that much. And we, we, we base the vulnerability caps off of the proportion, the theoretical maximum predation mortality as a ratio of the prey's natural mortality. So basically we would say, okay, we don't think that a single predator can account for more than half of all the natural mortality of a single prey. And so you could you could make different assumptions about, well, whether it's half or whether they can account for all the natural mortality by a single predator, uh, then you, you, can, you can set your caps based off of that proportion. Okay, thank you. Um... Then uh, I think Christy had another question right in the beginning about um, what do you see that uh, are the trade-offs for, for reducing the number of functional groups? You talked about it a little bit um, earlier in, in your discussion about going from the full model to mice. Um, uh, is the, is, and Christy's question, is the trade-off um, just the reduction in predation mortality or, or is there other trade-offs um, that you can also conceive? Yeah, so so one of the things in the mice models is that the ecotrophic efficiency for menhaden was really low. Like even for adult menhaden, it was like 0.1, um, which that came up a lot during the CDAR review. And so we did some sensitivity runs overnight um, and basically showed that the trade-off relationship didn't change that much. And we had the NWAX mice model to help understand well how much that predation mortality will be missing. Uh, but the biomass, the estimated biomass and the mortality rates of Menhaden are so are quite high. And um, and so the unexplained mortality was was still pretty high within the, the full NWAX model. And maybe that's OK. I mean, these fish die in huge schools and, and, and summer fish kills. And so there is a lot of other mortality going on out there. Uh, but so we lose that the, the accounting of predation mortality, but we also lose the ability to address broader ecosystem issues. So there's a lot of people out there that care about mammals. There's, you know, there's there's laws for protected species and there's and there's people that care about the shorebirds. And the ASMSC recognizes that that constituency is out there, um, but this model isn't able to address the effects on those predators. So, so following on from that, do you think if you got um, some good scenarios with the mice model, you could run those through the bigger model and see what that would do to the predators, for instance. I mean, I think that would be one way to address it. Yes, yeah, and that's actually how we had proposed to, to do all this as part of that LinFest project, that we could use the larger model to then screen these ERPs and the single species ERPs for other effects. One of the things that um, Andre's uh, master's student, Max Greslick, is working on now is basically doing that trade-off curve, but with the big model. Um, and what we'll be looking for there is, does the slope of the curve change as you have more predators in the system? Does that effect become steeper, um, the effect of menhaden harvest on predators? And so we, our plan is to kind of stitch all this back together to, to pull from both models to, to get at some of these questions. Thank you very much, David. I don't know if there's any other questions. Uh, those were the questions that were um, uh, specifically on, on his presentation. Um, if anybody has any other questions ecopathy related, now is your chance. Uh, there was one other question. Will the slides be made available? So, David, uh, would it be possible for people to get your slides? Can we put them on the website, the ecopathy website? Um, sure. Yeah, and, and I guess we will be, this, this is recorded. We should have told you this before. 
Um, this is recorded and that hopefully will also go on the Ecopath web website at some stage or YouTube channel or wherever it's put usually. Um, so any other questions that you might have now is your chance. I think we're, uh, we've got about, we've got, well, officially four minutes left, but if anybody else has any other questions, it's a good time. Or Vili or Christy, if you want to add anything, Lee, if you want to add anything. No, there's just, I'm just seeing shaking heads here. Um, David, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Uh, no. I I have a I have a question that's not actually, well, it's not really related to EcoPath or to to your talk. Well, it's sort of related to your talk. Um, in in the IC system, they they have this key run um, methodology whereby you know it it sounds like it's quite similar to what you're going through, and and there uh, you go through quite a an intensive process to get your model. To, certified as a key run uh, and maybe Vili knows more about how this compares to to what you're doing. Is it kind of a similar um, level of, of um, I don't know, uh, checking the model? Um, does anybody know? Vili, do you know? I think you you know about the key runs, do you, Vili? Oh, yeah, yeah we, we're using those also in other concepts, in other contexts. Uh, I think it is quite similar, even though they're not using the same terminology. But the structure of the CETA especially uh, leads in that direction without using that concept, mm -hmm. uh, con you know, the precise key run. But that's what we are talking about. It's, it's not Jabe. Um, you have a run and you say this is the accepted run at the end of it. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, that was part of the, the CDAR review process is that the, the CDAR review then approves the model for management use. Um, whether the managers use it is up to them, but it's basically like the best scientific um, information available. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's pretty much what the key run is. And and in order for it to be stamped as a key run, it ha it needs to go through quite a strong review and you need to write the report for it. And it's quite an intensive um, um, kind of process. So yeah. it's good to know that it, there's a similar process on, on both sides of the pond. Uh, yeah, Ruben, we've got a uh, 600 page one, document uh, re document too if anybody wants to look at it. <laughs> Sheila, Sheila, I think one reasonable question for Dave is um, the policy board. So they have about what's it, 20, 24 different stocks uh, and uh, boards that, that you deal with. And one big difference is in Europe, they've changed now to using regional boards, uh, so not species oriented boards. And what's the chance, Dave, that any of the other 20 or so boards would pay attention to what's happening in the Manhattan straight striped bass world? Um, well, we know we know for sure the striped bass is going to be involved, uh, probably bluefish as well, and, and wheat fish. Um, there's what we've done also pulls in Atlantic herring. And when you pull in Atlantic herring, now you're you're talking about a northern suite of species. Uh, but in reality, I think over the next three to five years, we'll probably still be focusing on maybe five of these boards trying to integrate their their targets and reference points and get their stock assessments aligned uh, so that we can repeat this process again in a more efficient manner. Uh, but I don't think that this is going, at least in the short term, I can't envision it, um, it, it linking up all 20 of those those management boards, but probably a handful that are the core predators of Manhattan. But this is for the ASMFC staff and uh, <laughs> to, to figure it all out. Um, so there's one last final question from Ruben uh, uh, from Conception in Chile saying, when you uh, reduce the number of groups, are you reducing the M2 mortality over, over of Menhaden? Is that what happens? Yes, effectively that happens. Yes. Okay. All right, so that I think is that, except if anybody else has any anything else to say. Um, all, it, all that uh, is, is left for me to do is to thank uh, David very much. It was very interesting. It's great to kind of get my head wrapped around stock assessments again and out of policy. 
Um, and thank you very much to our panelists, Veli, Christy, um, and Lee for getting all the technical uh, stuff sorted in the background. Um, and please, if anybody has a, a chance, uh, let us know what you thought. And we would really like to have a speaker for the next uh, seminar, um, which is, if I remember correctly, on September the 29th. So uh, thank you very much and uh, have a great rest of your day, evening if you're in, in on this side of the pond. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.